There's a piece of wood. You like it or you don't like it? Yeah, first I didn't really want it. Yeah, the funny thing is, once we just walked in here, we thought we had. Everybody, come on up here, please. We'll go ahead and we'll get started while we wait for uh, Alexis to come back. Yeah. Is he still uh, want to be a three ninety nine guy? Yeah. So let's just come back yet. No, not yet. Uh, real quick, so I went through the project management timeline sheets last night. Most are pretty good. Some are better than others. One of the things I made comments or questions on for everybody's was, are we testing the MVP? And I couldn't tell by some of the project tasks that were <coughs> listed. Excuse me. Are we testing the MVP? I think you guys actually may have had it written on yours, testing blah, blah, blah. I think I kind of understood what your guys was, but I wasn't sure if that is what you're testing. So we'll cover that tomorrow. Um, you guys had yours on there testing. Yeah, test prototype. Yeah. But was that the MVP? That's the difference. Okay. Because initially the MVP was what is the riskiest assumption that you're testing at this point? And we said we're all doing a leap of faith. <clears throat> Presumably, everything you're going to build is what you're testing. So we got to make that assumption. So, But there has to be an assumption on the market acceptance side.
So without any further ado, by the way, as a producer, can I also term it rainmaker? Would you like that term? I like that. Yeah. 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 That's where the money comes from. That's what you do. <laughs> but without any further ado, I want to introduce Mr. Ryan Hannigan, class of 2008, <laughs> rainmaker at J.J. Dory, and he will explain that. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you guys for having me. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, I think this class is awesome. Uh, just so you guys know, this class was not here when I graduated and I went here. And um, there was nothing like this even throughout college. Um, a lot of what I was taught in, the, uh, in college and was really what to think, not how to think. And to see a class like this encourage entrepreneurship and encourage you guys to think for yourselves and do things that you know you might not be used to doing that you can apply for the real world is is awesome that Maris is doing it and kudos for you guys for taking the class. Um, I hope you're uh, I hope you're taking advantage of it. So um, real quick, does anybody here know what they want to do with their life professionally once they graduate high school or college? Sure. Go ahead down here, sorry. Um, go into the army. Oh awesome man. How about you? I want to be an art director. Okay. Do you want to make a uh, career out of it? Yeah. That's awesome, man. Good for you. Uh, you someone? Uh, trade school. Stuff like that. Awesome. Okay. What do you want to do at trade school? What trade? Sprinkler fitter. Sprinkler fitter. Nice. Can you get in? Yeah. yeah. It's a great career if you can get in, man. Yeah. Um, and there's, there's uh, actually <laughs> more people should consider trade school because there's, uh, there's a lot of jobs out there that need to be filled. So. Um, but kind of the reason I wanted to ask you guys that I did not know what I wanted to do um, all throughout high school or college. Um, I graduated from Marist, as Mr. Henneberry said, in 2008, and then I uh, went to college, graduated in 2012 in college. I got a degree in marketing. Um, figured business was a good thing to fall back on if, if things went bad uh, or just to, to get into. Didn't, didn't really like math and didn't want to be in a cubicle all day, so I figured I would eventually you sell something and um, so I could be you know maybe outside the office a little bit and so um, I uh, I fell into the insurance and uh, insurance business I, uh, I used to caddy at Rich Country Club uh, throughout high school and college and uh, after I graduated I got a call from someone I used to caddy for and it asked me to come in and interview for a marketing uh, job at the startup they were having he worked for a commercial insurance agency um, and to just real quick give you an idea of what that is, we are the middleman between a customer, um, a business, so we work with construction companies, trucking companies, manufacturing companies, and we place their insurance with uh, a bunch of different carriers, whatever the marketplace is, we get them rates from different companies. So we broker their insurance with different companies. Um, and uh, But he, they wanted me to interview for a startup they had, which was basically like an e uh, e-surance, and we're you guys familiar with e-surance, um, where you buy your car insurance online. So they wanted to start a company where you bought small business insurance online. Um, and so my job was to do the social media marketing for that. Um, I came in, I said I would interview, and for about a week leading up to the interview, I was researching internet marketing and learning marketing on the internet because I hadn't retained anything from college. Um, but I guess I learned enough in that week because I got the job. And um, very quickly into the job, um, our SEO uh, vendor dropped the ball a little bit. And so our company was basically given a death sentence from Google. Um, and so the company wouldn't you could go 100 pages and you wouldn't find, find us. So um, at that point, my job became not only social media marketing, but I had to figure out how to get traffic to the website. And so I learned the SEO, search engine optimization. I built a new uh, website for the company to kind of scale it and grow the, uh, the target audience, um, or customer base rather. And um, I learned Facebook advertisement, how to drive traffic and business through that. And so my point in telling you all, telling you, you all this is because I had to learn all this on the fly. And I taught myself all of it through the internet. And um, But about a year later, I realized it still wasn't gonna get me to where I went, wanted to be. And so the person who brought me to the company who I met at Ridge, um, mentored me in outside sales, working for the uh, the primary insurance agency, selling out selling insurance to um, to companies. So I was out on the streets. I was making a lot of cold calls, and for the next three years, he was mentoring me, and I was trying to build up my book of business. 
And by book of business, I mean my customer base, all my customers. And so um, for three years, I did that. And in our industry, really in any industry, to get to the point where you could live comfortably off your commissions is it was the hardest thing I ever had to do professionally and probably the hardest thing I'll ever have to do. Um, and once I got there, I said I liked it so much, I walked away from it and left all my customers behind to join my mentor and his brother at a, a new company called JJ Doherty. And so we've been there for two years now. Um, it'll be two years, March 1st. And um, we've grown from the three of us and one other employee to 13 employees in two years. And we have two more starting in the next uh, two weeks. Actually, one of the, the people that was starting uh, was in a different industry, but we've been trying to convince him to get to work for us for quite a while. And so he called me out of the blue, asked me to get breakfast, and I knew what he wanted to do. I, he wanted to get a feel for what the job's like and if he would like it. And so I really wanted him to work for us. I think he's going to be great, and you know he uh, would be a good addition. But I had to try and sell him on the company. And if you guys didn't haven't found out already, insurance isn't the most exciting topic. So I had to figure out, but I love what I do. So I had to figure out why I like it. And so um, one thing I want to share with you guys is how I figured out, is this one the, uh, the next one, here we go. So I kind of sat down and I, I tried to figure out why I like what I do. Um, and it, it kind of realized it's, I can't, came down to five things. Okay, I love relationships, building relationships with people. One thing about my business is I work with many different industries and I get to meet a lot of people that have built companies from the ground up and I get to learn about their business and how they grew the company um, and I get to learn about it and build relationships with them. And so I'm not sitting in a cubicle all day, um, you know, in, in an Excel spreadsheet, which is, um, so that's one of the things I like about it. And then secondly, uh, I like the competition. It's a very, very competitive uh, industry that we're in, I thoroughly enjoy going up against another agency and winning business. Um, it's so it provides that um, self reliance. I am not a person that ever wanted to go and ask for a raise from somebody, ask permission for a raise. If I want to raise, I have to go out and get it. I'm all commission, and so I like that challenge. And so I like being self-reliant. Um, the other thing is flexibility. One thing that um, my industry affords is I could come here and talk to you guys on a day in the middle of the week. I could go out and play golf on a Friday in the summer, or go to a Cubs game on a Tuesday or whatever. Um, I'm not, I don't have a clock in, clock out schedule. Um, that's good for me. For other people, it, it, they, don't, they might not like that, but that's what I like about what I do. Um, and then the independence part of it, um, if you walk into an insurance agency, all the producers, the salespeople, the rainmakers, as Mr. Hanaberry referred to us as. Sorry, Mr. Hanaberry, I have a last minute dismissal for Abby McLaughlin. Okay, thank you. Um, basically, everyone is running their own company. They market how they want to market. They reach out to who they want to reach out to. You're not micromanaged, and you, you market yourself. You, you know, personal branding. Um, you get to you get to do all that. And so, if I'm uh, giving advice to, if you're trying to figure out what you're going to do, I would try to figure out what you want your day-to-day -day process to provide you with. Uh, maybe, um, maybe you enjoy fixing things, and so you want to, if you want to, you know, uh, fix something for a living. I don't know. I can't think of an example, but. Uh, the point is, figure out what you want your day-to-day -to, -day to provide you with, and then do that. And find, find a career that, that provides you with those things, because that's what's going to make you uh, motivated to get up in the morning. Um, so the other thing I just kind of wanted to leave you guys with um, is some of the things that I've, I've found myself um, that have helped me get to the point where I'm at the position that I'm in and that I found it was most, most common among the most successful people that I know, um, including my mentor and the people that I uh, worked for before and work for now, work with now. And um, also some of the people that are on that list that I shared with you guys, um, 
on the internet, some of the most successful entrepreneurs um, out there. And it, outside of hard work, um, nothing valuable comes fast. Okay, If you want to start your own business, it's going to be very, very hard at first. You have to be resilient and you have to sacrifice. If you want to characterize my 20s, I'm 29 now. Since I graduated college, my whole um, mindset has been sacrificing the short term for long term value. Um, the job I took initially did not pay very well. Most of my friends uh, moved up to the city right after college. I lived at home with my parents for a couple of years. Um, once I, uh, I reached a point, as I talked about, got to the point where I could live off my book of business, I had the opportunity to leave. And, uh, you know, initially I knew it was going to be tough. Um, you know, we've had to build, it's hard to build a company and build up your book of business again. But I knew that the financial upside for the future would increase if I left that behind. Um, struggled for a couple of years and then uh, um, eventually I could get to a point where now if I don't get to where my position is significantly better in the next three, four or five years, the only reason will be because I didn't work hard enough. And so sacrifice in the short term to make your future better um, and then be accountable. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, the most successful people I know, their losses or when they struggle or something doesn't go right, they're accountable for it no matter, no matter what the instances is. There's this book called Extreme Ownership by a guy named Jocko Willing. He's a, he's a Navy SEAL. Um, there's some, some info on him on that sheet, but they do, he does this, um, all these people, no matter what happens, no matter how untenable the situation might have been. You know, I lost a customer three months ago, and I didn't think I deserved to lose it. I still don't. You know, it was, a, it was a tough spot, but, you know, I could either sit there and live with the consequences and dwell, or I could figure out some way I can improve. So maybe the next time something, a similar situation presents itself, um, I could figure out how to tilt it in my direction that time. And so it's hard. You're going to want to blame other people, but, if, you know, for your failures or your losses, as you're, you know, figuring out what you want to do and you're growing whatever career you guys choose, be accountable for your losses and take responsibility for them. Do not blame anybody else. Um, and then you have to expose yourself to, to uncomfortable situations. Um, I know this class, you guys do a lot of public speaking from what I understand. You might not like speaking in front of large groups, but I guarantee you by the end of the year, you're going to be better at speaking in front of people than you were at the beginning of the year. And so, for me, going to a, a business and meeting, you know, I look young. I looked even younger when I was 25. And going to a, a meeting by myself with a business owner who's 60 years old and has built his company from the ground up for 30 years can be an intimidating situation. And I guarantee you the first time I did that, the meeting did not go well. In fact, I know it didn't. Um, but now I do it all the time, and I'm better for it. And so put yourself in situations that are uncomfortable at first because that's how you grow and that's how you become better. And that's how we train people at our company. And, uh, that's how, that's how you become better and grow. So, and then fourth, you know, I wanted to include this be authentic because it's extremely, extremely important. And the reason it's important, you cannot be afraid to be yourself to people because when you're not yourself, you become insecure. When you're insecure, you lose confidence. And it's almost impossible to succeed at anything if you don't have confidence. So, you know, with the internet and, uh, you know, everybody's a critic and people are always going to be judging you. And now it's not just your friends. It's, it's, uh, it's a bunch of other people that you don't know online. So the most, uh, the most successful deals that I've been able to close are the ones where um, I was myself. And I always try to be myself because there's a lot of uh, canned terms that people come in with. They try to act like they're, they're more than they are. They've, they've been around more than they have. And people see through it. I mean, if you could, uh, if you could uh, just be yourself, people appreciate it. And it's becoming a, a, a rarer and rarer quality. So those are the four things that have worked to me, helped me get to my position um, where 
again, um, it's been a grind my whole 20s. You know, I don't, um, I still rent the suits from the factory store at Banana Republic. I'm not fancy or anything, but I have the opportunity to, uh, to advance over the next decade. And so these are the things that have worked for me and really have worked for some of the most successful people I know. And so um, I, if it's cool with you guys, I would like to open it up with some Q or finish off with some Q&A. Is there any questions right off the bat that anybody has? Yeah, go ahead. What's your name? College. Oh, my name's Joe. Joe? Where did I you went, go to college? So college is funny. I went to Iowa primarily, but I took kind of a, a roundabout way. I went to a couple of different schools. Um, and it's funny, I don't have a real good reason for doing that. Um, I think uh, I didn't get a lot out of college, um, but uh, at, the, at the end of it, you know, I, I figured I would finish it anyway. Um, so I graduated from St. Xavier, but I also went to Iowa. What did yeah. you originally go to college for? Um, I think I, it was, uh, I was undecided or communications. I think it was communications. Um, so I, I figured out I wanted to do something where I could kind of get out of the office and meet people. And so I'm lucky I fell into the insurance industry and in our industry, really the five things that I talked about that I value and why I enjoy it so much, um, I had kind of coincide with a lot of the reasons why I chose that major. I eventually switched over to marketing because I thought it was a stronger degree to fall back on. So, um, but yeah. Let me follow that one up with, first of all, why'd you go to college? Because I don't believe college is for everybody. Yeah. I don't, you know, there's a lot of different reasons people go. Did you force to, were you forced to go? Did you say, this is what we're supposed to do. I went to Marist High School and they blah, blah, blah. I'm supposed to go to college. Why did you go? Yeah, I mean, honestly, I went to college because most of, uh, it seemed like just the logical path. Everybody goes to high school and they go to college and, um, to be honest, you know, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you not to go to college. I don't want any of your parents getting mad at me saying, Mr. Henry brought somebody in and told me not to go to college. But um, I'm also not going to sit here and say you should take out $200,000 in student loans to go to college. Um, you know, for marketing, if you want to learn about marketing, you can learn more about marketing from watching Gary Vaynerchuk videos on YouTube than you can four years of college. I learned more about the real world and marketing in my first month, two months in the real world, forcing myself to learn it through the internet than I did in four years of college. Um, but you know, I went to college, I guess, because it was it was the traditional thing to do. Um, and once and I, fi I finished it really because I was so far in that um, you know it just made sense, I guess. But it's funny, I uh, I I don't really. Can, uh, can, uh, nothing that I learned in college really contributes to my day to day. However, I would not have gotten my job if I didn't go to college because the person called me because I majored in marketing and had a degree in marketing. That's changing um, as the internet and there's just more opportunities and more ways, there's more paths for people. You know, 30 years ago, it probably made sense 40 years ago it probably made sense to go to college because that was the only way and the people that hired me uh it wasn't really my mentor it was, it was some other people it was important to them that i graduated from marketing i don't think i would have had that opportunity if i didn't get my degree but i think 20 years from now our generation when we're the gatekeepers that degree is not going to be a deal breaker and it's going to be more about the person their emotional intelligence and and what they what they bring and you know, other variables. But yeah, I mean, college is uh, there's more than one route now, and trade schools is another great one because there's less and less people going to trade schools, and those are skills that society needs. So that's my two cents on college. What's the best part about being your own boss? Um, you know, I would, uh, I would, uh, I would say, you know, the independence of it. Um, I have, you know, I would consider my partners, my bosses per se. I'm lucky that they've given me the opportunity to have some, some ownership in the company. And, um, but yeah, I mean that they don't force me to do anything or, 
or, uh, you know, I could do what I want, but I mean, the best part is, is, is the flexibility of, of having, you know, not being uh, beholden to, to being in a certain place at a certain time and really just going out and meeting people and, and trying to, uh, build up my book of business on my own. So yeah. What's your name? Jeff. Jeff. Nice yeah. to meet you. Nice to meet you. Um, how'd you get from like doing like social media to like working on your book? Uh, so I asked, I asked, uh, I, I saw how much more, quite frankly, I saw how much more money, uh, money people were making on that side of the business and then how much money I was making. And I was also at that time, again, in a, a cubicle, in a cubicle all day, basically. And so I asked, I would like to do what you do. And so, um, they agreed and, and so I transitioned into that. That's a good point though. You. You have to be able to, when you guys are in your careers, you have to be able to ask for what you want. Because um, a lot of people are afraid to do that. And then they end up working on a job they don't enjoy for three to five years or whatever. So, yeah. My name's Joe. <clears throat> Joe, nice to meet you. Have gotten the job you have now if you didn't have your book? Like, if you'd already worked on it for two years? So I had to leave all those customers behind. Oh, I thought you were So, no, the day I, I left my old company, uh, I started from scratch. So the last two years, uh, I don't recommend this to anybody, but I've pretty much been piling up credit card debt and uh, paying the bills that way. Um, and now I've been able to pay that off and I'm in a good position now. But um, but yeah, I mean, and that's the point. I had to take three steps back, but I created more financial opportunity for myself in the future. And I gave myself more upside. And so you have to, that's what I'm talking about when you have to sacrifice in the short term to present yourself with a better opportunity long term. And so, yeah, go ahead. So what's the difference from like what you do now compared to like what you were doing like before that? Uh, I own some of the company. So but it's the same thing. Yeah. It's nice to get a skin in the game, huh? Yeah, exactly. And I'm fortunate that the person that mentored me and his brother, who did for, to a lesser degree, uh, and, I, and I consider two of my best friends, two of my best friends now, um, gave me the opportunity to do this with them. Um, so, but yeah. Yep. How much do you like own like of the company, and like what like authority does that give you? I guess. Um, so they were able to, to to start the company with their book of business, and that's kind of what's been getting us through. So they own a lot more than I do. Um, I don't want to sit here and act like I'm, I left on my own and started my own company. Um, I found two guys that I could really trust um, and that I recognized wanted what was best for me. And so I went with them. And um, in terms of, so we have all these different carriers. I, I manage one of our carriers in that relationship. Um, but my primary role with us is bringing in business and growing the, and growing the, and helping grow the company that way. Um, so that's my primary role with the company. Uh, with like being your own boss and having your own schedule, do you find it like challenging to ever get off task or like kind of take a break for a while? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I mean, you have to be disciplined uh, if you want to have that flexibility. Um, and so for me, um, yeah, I mean, there, there's certain times where you know you don't feel like working. Um, but you really have to just make sure in the time you're allotting for work that you're, that you're doing the work. And, uh, you know, I'm built that I, you know, I spend most of my day from the, when I wake up till when I go to sleep working, whether it's sending emails or, in some, or messaging people on LinkedIn. Um, I enjoy that work. And so, um, cause I know I'm building towards something bigger and so. I enjoy it, but it's not built for everybody. You have to be disciplined, for sure. So let me interject something here, Zeb. So <clears throat> I know the owner of his previous company. And I said in the early classes, I'll say it now, but that guy prints money. <laughs> he, just, he can go to his basement and just roll that thing out. Money is just spitting. So I have a lot of respect for Mr. Hannigan that the fact that he took a risk, took a chance to leave a very well-established company, and that's something everybody will do. Forget being an entrepreneur, but somewhere in life, you're going to be challenged. Do I take a risk? Do I leave what I have? 
you know, two in the bush is better than one in the hand. And he took the risk to leave. You got to be young to be able to take that chance. You got to be ballsy to say, you know what, I'm going to give it a shot because I got nothing to lose at this point. But the company he was at, he could probably make a lot more money and still make a lot more money then versus where he is now. But the question is, an entrepreneur or just a regular person in life, what do you want to do to succeed? What's it going to take to succeed? And I think Ryan, you've done a great job with it. So, yeah, I appreciate it. And to that point, it's not all about money. Um, again, I would find out what motivates you every day and provides you the most meaning. Because I mean, there's a lot of rich people that are unhappy, and there's a lot of people that, um, you know, are, are don't have a lot of money, but but there's a lot of meaning in their life. And so I would try to find something that's meaningful. Um, because, you know, there's going to be, that's how, you know, there's, some, there's a quote in there um, that I found, happiness is temporary, right? So if you have, there's going to be stuff that happens in your life that's going to flatten you. There's a lot of tragedy that somebody's, you're all going to experience tragedy. That happiness goes away. But when you have a meaningful day-to-day -day that you can go to, that's going to help you move on. And so whatever it is you guys decide to do, just you know, make sure it, it, you find it meaningful and it's purposeful. So that's what I would say about that. Um, any other questions? Down here. Go ahead. What would you oh, do differently, or where do you think you'd be now if you didn't go to college? Well, again, I I wouldn't I wouldn't be where I'm at if I didn't go to college. Um, and again, that's because the gatekeeper, the, 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 most of the gatekeepers that are in charge now. And it's becoming less and less value the degree, and so that's how I got in there. You know, if I if I had not gone to college, I don't think I would have whoever would have thought to call me. But that doesn't mean I wouldn't have found something else that I enjoy or or, or, or whatever. But um, yeah, I mean, it's for me the the path that I took uh, worked out. Um, but to your point, I think what you're getting at is what how could it you know. How could it have worked out if I didn't go to college? I still knew Jerry Dory, and I still met him at uh, Ridge Country Club. And um, I have about four or five other friends who caddied with me, who currently work with people they met at Ridge, and because they caddied with, they caddied for these people and they met them. So, what I would recommend doing is surround yourself with successful people, learn more about different industries, and get their advice. And, um, you know, go to career days, if Marist has career days, um, you know, go to networking events, go to, you know, get on LinkedIn and, and, and you know, or Instagram and DM entrepreneurs in the area. And just try to meet people and learn more about, about industries and, and their paths. So that's what I would, I would say to that. Has anybody, uh, real quick question, uh, did I ask this? Is, Anybody here on Facebook? Did I ever ask this question? No. How many people here are on Facebook? Anybody here not on Facebook? Okay. Um, is anybody here on LinkedIn? Okay, not one person, all three classes. Yeah. No, one person. There was one person. Yeah, it, it yeah. Was, he's the exception for that part. Yeah, yeah. Got it. But anyway, if you're in business to business sales, um, LinkedIn is is the most effective social media tool to, to get people's attention and find decision makers. Um, and so it's a great way to, to, to get access or at least a, a channel to, you know, decision makers at, at these companies. Um, but, uh, everybody here, I assume this is just out of curious because I'm curious. Everybody here on Snapchat and Instagram, maybe here or not. Uh, anybody have a YouTube channel? <laughs> what do you do on the YouTube channel? Uh, put school products on. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting. Facebook was, uh, it's, it's getting an old, older demographic nowadays. So, you guys not on it because your parents are on it? Yeah. yeah. Um, any other questions you guys might have? Has anybody ever heard of the people, some of the people that I've, I've listed on here? Just as a reference point, uh, everybody up in the room, two of the people on here, that Gary Vanderchuk and Jocko Willow, the guy who spoke 
from Dolly.com, Kevin Cullum, and those two guys that he said he had followed as part of a uh, motivational thing that he does. If you remember him from early on in the semester. Yeah, and, and some of these things, so nothing valuable comes fast. If you type that into YouTube, it's not just going to be these people that, that have videos on that. It's going to be dozens and endless entrepreneurs that talk about the same thing. And so same thing with be accountable. And so that's what I mean with, you know, when I say the most successful people, um, there's some common themes. These are some of those things that are very common in those people. So, um, and yeah, I mean, to the, the college thing, there's so much content that you can consume through the internet. You know, 10 years ago, you had to wait to, um, 20 years ago, you would have to wait you didn't, this didn't exist. You have to wait until one of these guys printed a book, or they came to your city and did a speaking tour, maybe once a year, or maybe they did an interview on Good Morning America or something, and if you didn't catch it at that time, you weren't able to DVR it, so or go on the internet and stream it. So having the, all these people on the internet and literally at your fingertips is is just something that nobody else had before ten years ago. So take advantage of it. Who does the interviewing at your company to hire new people? Are you part of that process? Uh, I'm not. I, I helped with uh, this latest salesperson, but uh, John and Jerry Dory do the interviewing. Yeah. What do you look for when you hire a person? So emotional intelligence. Are they a good people person? Um, I don't even think we asked. Uh, we, I mean, I don't even think we asked. Who you know where you went to college right off the bat? Um, we might know beforehand, um, but it's not a deal breaker for us. And so it's really is this person uh, good? At, are they easy to talk to? Are they outgoing? Um, and are they going to work hard um, and try to improve themselves? So I mean, it's really um, and there's there's some stuff about emotional intelligence that Gary Vaynerchuk has a lot of that on. And so it's really your people skills. And your kind of um, uh, common sense and ability to think and interact with people that is probably the number one thing that we look for. That's because it's relationship driven, then. Exactly. Yeah. And does, does that apply across many businesses or industries? Yeah, I think I think emotional intelligence is the most important quality you could have uh, because it's gonna it gives you. The ability to succeed in many different industries. Do you have a question? Yeah. And I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was wondering, do you talk like directly to like the insurance providers, or like mostly with the customer? Uh, we, we do with both. So I mean, a lot of times we have to sell not only the customer, but we have to sell the underwriter, and the underwriter is the person, the representative from the insurance carrier, that prices the account and decides whether or not they're going to offer a quote on it. And so we have to manage both relationships. We're, we're the middleman between both. And so, yeah, we have to sell them sometimes and build relationships with them um, because you might need them to do you a favor um, and write an account sometimes. So, yep, sorry. How would you gauge emotional intelligence in an interview? Like, how would you find like, where yeah. they are? Yeah, it's, it's hard. It is hard. Um, and it's 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 not going to come from uh, it might not come from just one interview. I mean, if you meet somebody, say you meet somebody you know in the cafeteria or, or something, um, or say you meet someone in a restaurant, you're sitting, and they start talking to you, I and mean, you can tell pretty quickly if this person is outgoing or what kind of person they are. If they go, I, and they just give you one word answers to stuff, you know you know pretty quickly that's probably not going to be a person you want to put in a sales position. So, I mean, it, it takes a lot of uh, good judgment on our part, John and Jerry's part as well, but, I mean, it's tough. It's not uh, It's not the easiest thing to, to spot, but, um, you know, hopefully you're, you learn by meeting different people. So, But it's somewhat subjective. It's, it's somewhat definitely. personal. Yes. Human bias yeah. plays into a part as well. Absolutely. Yeah. What skill sets would you recommend? Not getting into your industry, but getting out in the business world. Is there specific skills other than 
emotional intelligence. Yeah. Uh, so something tangible. Yeah. So um, I would say you have to be willing to meet people. You have to be outgoing, and you have to be uh, you have to be willing to put yourself in situations you might not be comfortable with immediately. Um, you know, I go back to the, the example of me going out of my first meeting with an intimidating you know, person um, that runs a business. Um, you have to be willing to get comfortable in those situations because that's the only way you're going to learn how to handle them better. Um, and so, you know, there's a, there's a question that uh, is very famous. What do you consider your weaknesses to be? And most, it's, you know, there's running jokes like, uh, I'm too awesome, or I, uh, I like people too much or something. But the reason people ask that question is not, it's not going to be a, if you can't answer the question good, it's not going to be a deal breaker. But the reason that question is asked, and if you could answer it uh, in a good way and thoughtfully, it's going gonna, it's gonna to put you in a level above everybody else because they're going to remember you. And it's going to show that you are looking to improve in different ways. Um, you know, so you know, one, one example for me, I have a hard time uh, giving people bad news. And so I had to work on how to do that in a way that um, people respect it. Because I, I hated giving people bad news. I hate giving customers bad news that they were getting a, a rate increase or whatever. Um, but it shows, if you can answer that question, it shows that you've been introspective about your abilities and that you're interested in improving them. It's just, uh, just, a, just a, a thought. All right, there's just a couple of minutes left. If there's no more questions, I'm just going to let Mr. Hannigan go so he can beat the hallway rush here in the lunchroom rush. Anything else? Anybody want to throw anything on the table? Okay, pretty good. Let's thank Mr. Hannigan for being here.